So reviving our motivation. Is your camera meant to be off? Sanghe churam sanghe churam bhai janchu padu dhani kapsu chi dagi chun yangi pe sonam ki drola penjya sanghe drupa sho sanghe churam sanghe churam bhai janchu padu dhani kapsu chi dagi chun yangi pe sonam ki drola penjya sanghe drupa Okay. So this session, we're going to look at the seven wisdoms and talk a little bit about this concept of front generation and self generation. And I guess the proviso is just a reminder that there are many types of ignorance, therefore we need many types of wisdom. <laughs> so in Buddhism, we mostly talk about two types of ignorance, the ignorance that doesn't know and the ignorance that knows wrongly right? Mm -hmm. The ignorance that knows wrongly. And the root of samsara is which kind, friends? <laughs> What's the main problem? What's the main troublemaker? Ignorance. Do you remember? You know that it's ignorance. This we know. Yes, we know the problem is ignorance. But what does it think? Or what does it not think? Hmm. Yes, please. Yeah, it, it's an incorrect view of reality that grasps that the self is inherently existing is that no yeah yeah exactly yeah the incorrect view of reality in particular the incorrect view of the reality of the self um and then everything else flows from that um you know it, it's like if there was a start but there's no start because beginningless time if there were a start, it would be self-grasping and then grasping at phenomena. But then when we're realizing it, some schools of thought say you need to realize the emptiness of phenomena, then the emptiness of self. Some say self first, then phenomena. It's a whole tenants discussion, fun for another day. But if we're thinking about the root ignorance, the big ignorance that we really need to get rid of, it's the way that we view this I, this conventional I, and then we superimpose something extra on it. Yeah, so there's this conventional eye, and it's not the ultimate eye, but it's conventional and it's kind of like loosely, okay, we can work with that. But then we add this idea of inherence to it, not consciously, but innately. Yeah, it's just our default problem that we have, which is we view the eye in our own mental continuum and hold it to exist inherently. And this means that everything feels dualistic. This means that everything has an appearance of other. It means things feel separate that aren't separate. It doesn't mean that the reality of things is that we are one. We are not one. We are interconnected. We are almost infinitely interconnected. But that's not the same thing as us all being one. And the reason I say that is because lots of folks who are good, friendly folks that are moving their minds in this direction like to say, oh, we're all one, we're all one. And it is sort of loosely true, loosely true. But if you think we're all big one eye, then it becomes almost like one giant eye and it's still problematic. Yeah. So it's, it's more like there are no eyes or no selves, but there is experience. And there is interconnection, there is mind, and none of those things are inherently existent. And there is a self conventionally. What is the conventional self? That which is merely labeled on the collection of body and mind, or the five aggregates, the five skandhas. The problem with our ignorance is we think there is more than that. If we just operated with the conventional self, and just said, yeah, sure, merely labeled on the collection, which is merely labeled on their own collections and their collections and their collections. If we kind of lived in that knowledge, we would not cause so much trouble. But we believe that there's more. 
and then it needs to be protected and supported and defended by all of these things perceived as others and there's constant push and pull throughout all our life yeah we are attracted to what supports this false eye we are averse to what seems to harm this false eye and that kind of ignorance we need to cut with wisdom but there's also ignorance about cause and effect and ignorance about cause and effect makes you not ethical yeah ignorance about all sorts of things all sorts of wrong views and so these different kinds of wisdom that manjushri helps us embody some of them are very practical and immediate and some of them are long term and all of them are in a way both but when you see something like the wisdom of composition it's not an invitation for us to all write books it's saying that once our wisdom is integrated may whatever we write have this power of manjushri to kind of pierce through the ignorance of the reader and you know the difference between reading maybe a dharma book that is coming from someone's deep experience and knowledge but is presented colloquially as opposed to someone who is just barely understood dharma barely experienced anything and is making a watered down presentation so you know this difference right so you could have two texts that are of similar language that aren't like super scholarly neither one of them super scholarly neither one of them fancy language but one of them has the ring of truth and one of them is dharma light yeah and all the cream has been shaved off mm -hmm. but also all of the nutrients have been shaved off but it's kind of cute and inspiring but it's got that edge of like hallmark card cliche you know and it's kind of cringy yeah and bless their hearts but so it's like i'm sure it's well intentioned but we have to be really careful that when we're looking at dharma books colloquial isn't bad conversational isn't bad but we want to be looking for those ones that have the ring of truth and of course the prime example is venerable pema children who speaks in everyday language but it has that ring of truth when you read her words and the other side is you can have people that are very technical and use all the precise definitions and the precise debate formulas but it's got no juice you know it's got no flavor because they're just stuck in their heads and then you can read some texts where the translator and the original author and everybody is really in resonance with actual wisdom and even if you're not totally sure what's being said you can feel the truth of it yeah so these are sorts of forms of intuition that we can educate to be more and more refined and precise to be able to engage with our study more deeply to be able to sort out what is a good explanation from what is a bad explanation because of course we have good teachers and we have access to teachings but a lot of this path is you sifting and sorting through the dharma to find out what can you practice today and what does that look like what can you take on board and integrate so manjushri wisdom is very much helping you kind of be able to sift through and be able to hear that ring of truth from valid sources and to be able to really notice those explanations which are a bit faulty or the sources from which have a little bit of something sus yeah so we want to trust ourselves we want to trust our own wisdom but we also want to be continually educating that wisdom so that we become more and more precise so many types of wisdom to counteract many types of ignorance now in the visualization that we just did with the seven wisdoms various things go out and come in and go out and come in where is it coming from where is it going to might be very obvious just from the words of the sadhana or not and so if it's not obvious you're not alone we can totally unpack it so i'll just start with the first one and um, and chime in if you have questions so with this first one as our example we want great understanding. What is great understanding? The ability to understand and explain the meanings of the extensive scriptures without resistance. So you think that this concept takes the form of orange colored nectar beams, which then become clarified as pure Lord Manjushri, emitted from Manjushri. And you're like, what? Wait, what? where is he who is he what's happening am i not manjushri who is manjushri so <laughs> this is where it's easy to get stuck and if you're doing this in its fully fledged form as someone with the empowerment you are manjushri the self-generation 
and there is a front generation Manjushri in front of you, facing you. And it's not explicitly written out in the text, but all sadhanas have both front and self-generation, whether it's written or not. At least in some part of the text, there is a relationship between front and self. The front generated deity is the archetypal energy of that Buddha, one in nature with your own root guru, in that form. You, the self-generated deity, are the archetypal energy, one in nature with your own root guru, but you. <laughs> so you're like, hmm. So it's kind of like you're looking in a mirror, but not quite. Because, in, because you, don't, you wouldn't need to do this if you already had completely merged. But because we're not quite merged with the guru deity, we need to have this impression of there's the outer one and the inner one. Just like in the sutra path, there's the inner refuge and the outer refuge. The inner refuge being our own mind, the outer refuge is being Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So in this case, this is an elevated form of that where you have the outer guru, who maybe in the beginning of the sadhana is the one that you're taking refuge in front of. Sometimes there's purification practices and various merit-making practices, maybe offerings there, and then later offerings to the self-generation. That's quite common, where you first get front-generation making offerings, then self-generation making offerings. And, you know, you can be kind of tangled like, so I get that Manjushri, or whoever the deity is, is getting a lot of offerings, but is it me or is it you? And it's like, it's first you, then it's me, then we're merged. <laughs> yes. And we're trying to kind of have the, the idea of being merged the whole time. Your mind mixed with the guru's mind. Yeah. So the guru deity is what we're really talking about in all tantric forms. And the guru deity is like this teacher-ness of all Buddhas, which can take the form of any deity whatsoever. And it can be like... The real flesh and blood llama that you have is wearing a Manjushri suit. Yes, <laughs> they're wearing a Manjushri suit, but it's them. Yeah, their little eyes twinkling out of Manjushri's eyes like this. Yeah, this is my framing. But the way you're seeing it is that the llama nest, it has to start as a flesh and blood person who you relate to. But as you mature in your practice, it becomes more and more connection with the great beyond, connection with the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas, and less and less referential to the flesh and blood person who was the catalyst for this whole relationship. So the flesh and blood guru is like your training wheels guru or your introductory level relationship with the guru. As you become more mature, the guru goes farther and farther inside but the concept becomes more and more vast and less and less trapped by your conceptions of this human being in front of you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit like if you grew up Christian, when you were a little kid, maybe you thought of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know, God is the Father in quite a literal paternal way, like, don't get mad at me, please save me, like a little kid. And then as you grew up, you had kind of a more adult relationship with the father as mentorship and explain and be an example for. And then you grew up further and it became a much more amorphous concept. And the three father, son, Holy Spirit merged into one. And that merging three into one felt like a vast spaciousness connection, which was just love. Yeah, so, so some of us who grew up as, you know, friendly Christians have ideas like this, you know, if you were brought up fundamentalist, you may have darker thoughts. But um, anyway, I was obviously a Methodist. So anyway, um, yes, thanks, mom. Um, but yes, my father was a Catholic, and I understand about fundamentalism. So I hear you, I feel your pain. Best of luck. Putting that aside, when we're doing Tantra, it's that same thing where you do start in kind of a child way where you want this flesh and blood llama to like you, to understand you, to support you, to tell you what to do. And then you grow up because you've merged with the wisdom they were showing you. Their wisdom resonated with your wisdom. The outer guru started talking to the inner guru 
And you realize that the insights that you integrated were already theirs for you to take, right? Like you were already there with those insights. You just needed something to shine the light on them and to help you develop them. Because you could only hear wisdom from the guru that you were open to hearing. Mm -hmm. I, I had this conversation with the nuns at Chen Rezig a lot when my teacher would give these five day Lam Rim retreats every year. And every year we wound up saying the same thing like, oh, he's going so much deeper this year. Have you noticed? So much deeper this year. And then you'd read the transcripts of the previous year and be like, yeah, no, it's exactly the same. <laughs> You know, and it's like, no, he wasn't going deeper. He's been deep the whole time. I've got bigger ears. <laughs> yeah, I can hear more deeply. Yeah. So it's, it's a bit like that where you kind of eventually the training wheels come off and it's still very useful to have the personification of the Buddha in the sense of a teacher, but really the teacher is in you. And you can hear it out of you from anywhere. You can hear the guru in anything. And you'll sometimes hear teachers like Lama Zopa Rinpoche say, you know, all statues, scriptures, and stupas that are one in nature with the guru. And you're like, but they're statues and books. What do you mean, Rinpoche? <laughs> right? And it's like, if you can tune into these as literal embodiments or representations or one in nature with the root guru, there's a communication that starts to happen. And you're not falling into the trap of thinking that they are literally enlightened beings. You're thinking literally enlightened beings are there. But that's also metal conventionally. And that's also filled with sawdust and, you know, mantras rolled up and relics and stuff. You know, like you're not getting weird about it. You know, and if someone destroys the statue, you don't think the Buddha has been destroyed. You think that was a negativity and that was a really naughty thing that they did. But the Buddha cannot be destroyed. You're not being weird. You know what I mean? but you're still recognizing that these images were gifted to us by the enlightened mind for a particular purpose. And so these images have a particular power because of the minds who made them. So they're not holy objects from their own side. They're holy objects because many causes and conditions came together for their development. So our interactions with them are more powerful. So sometimes we say, you know, just, just from the side of the holy object, this magic thing happens, that magic thing happens. It is quite true, but there is fine print there. It's not like everything is empty of inherent existence except holy objects, <laughs> you know, uh, right? Like holy objects are empty of inherent existence too. So our tantra thoughts have to be really woven with wisdom constantly because it gets very ephemeral and amorphous and very magical and esoteric and we could get lost in the poetry of it if we don't keep ourselves grounded in wisdom and you know if you think of something like um Lama Zopa Rinpoche is always finding these amazing mantras that just by seeing purifies all these eons of negative karma. Have you mm -hmm. heard these things? Or just by walking under them, suddenly the door to the lower realm is lower realms are closed. And you're like, that's great, but why? Okay. <laughs> Should I just be continuously walking back and forth <laughs> underneath this mantra? Like, why am I practicing? Maybe I should just stand under this and hope for the best, right? <laughs> So what he's saying is true, but he's not giving us the fine print. What he's saying is true, and he says it simply in order to get us motivated to do even something. But the philosophy and the energy and the reasoning under things like that is very similar to something that we have experience of, say, in the law or in um, the way laws are written. For example, do you remember in the 90s when um, hate crime legislation was a big thing and lots of states were trying to get hate crimes legislation on the books? And one of the classic arguments that lobbyists would give was th certain things done with hatred for a whole group of people are worse mm -hmm. than the same action done to a person just because you don't like them. And people would argue about this and there were all sorts of arguments on both sides. But one of the cleanest arguments was take something simple like graffiti, okay? So say you see graffiti on the wall and it says, Sam loves Kate with a heart. And then you see, so it's, you know, Sam loves Kate, three letters and a heart, a symbol. 
And then you see death to Jews and a swastika, three letters and a symbol. Is it the same crime? It's not the same crime, is it? They have two totally different impacts on your mind. Sam loves Kate is cute, it's annoying, children shouldn't write on buildings, stop it. Death to Jews is horrific, right? It, it calls into question the whole atmosphere of the society around those words. How could such words appear in your community? What hatred is under the surface? You know, it's speaking to everyone. Whereas Sam Loves Kate is just speaking to Sam and Kate and maybe their friends. So this is the kind of the, some of the reasoning underneath the power of mantras is that the mantras don't have this power from their own side, but because of who put them there and how they came about, and then our mind meeting them, there is a power because of that. But if one of those conditions wasn't there, it wouldn't work. Yeah, if it wasn't a holy mind that made it, and it wasn't a sentient being that met it, it wouldn't work. Yeah. Does that reasoning help you understand why mantras have power? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's similar with like flags, you know, like a flag doesn't have any meaning if you don't know what it means. But if your whole life you grew up, you know, with your whole family telling you the flag means freedom, then when you see the flag, it means freedom. <laughs> But if you didn't know that, it doesn't have any imprint on your mind particularly. Now, holy objects are like that, plus the person that made them was enlightened. And so there is meaning even before you know the meaning. But that meaning it has didn't come out of nowhere. It still has causes and conditions. Do you need to clarify anything about that? Is it making sense? Yeah, go ahead, Teresa. I'm still stuck on the Lama in the Manjushri suit. I really like this, the twinkling eyes. So then I'm thinking as I mature, what happens to that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What happens um, down the track when you've integrated this idea? And it's not like when we merge with the deity or we merge with the Lama that we're literally merging, but it's as if our minds are mixing and become in total resonance with each other. Just like, you know, the being that became Manjushri, the first one, or the being that became Tara, the first one, have equal qualities and equal abilities. Still those beings before they were Buddhas had different karma and different behaviors and different stories. Mm -hmm. So they can share each other's qualities and communicate with one another, but they are not the same being, even though one could adopt the aspect of the other, you know, like twins who look the same, they're not the same person, but they can adopt the aspect of the other and, you know, fool their parents, maybe, <laughs> depending, right? So for us, what we're trying to do is adopt the aspect of thinking that we are the llama, but not in a weird way. <laughs> You know? and that we are the deity but not in a weird way which is why tantra is not for beginners because you see how quickly it could get weird um and so it's almost easier to think of yourself as the deity than to think of yourself as the llama strangely you know but they're the same thing they're the same thing because what is the llama really the llama is some sort of deep wisdom that you're tuning into via the gateway of this person you met mm -hmm. which is why the person that you take tantra from must be stable mm -hmm. they must have ethics not because people without ethics are bad and rubbish and should be discarded or whatever no but because if you're looking for a gateway to the divine mm -hmm. it needs to be a stable gateway that you're not going to be afraid to be under mm -hmm. or cross through so the, you know, I'm trying to put into words things that are beyond words, but I, I think that if you can think of the guru disciple relationship and the guru yidam or the guru deity disciple relationship as something that's progressive. So it's like they become closer and closer to your mind, and then the outer version becomes bigger and bigger and vaster and encompasses more. So it starts out as two people collaborating about wisdom. One is a student, one is a teacher, two human beings in a mentorship-mentee relationship. And then it evolves into 
here is a Buddha, here is an almost Buddha. This almost Buddha is gradually coming closer and closer to the real Buddha until their minds mix and they become of same qualities and abilities. But still, as ordinary people, we have no idea who our gurus are. They could be actually um, lower on the path than ourselves. <laughs> we have no idea, no idea. But that doesn't actually matter. <laughs> yeah. What matters is if their consistent appearance to your mind is ethics and it's steady enough, if their consistent appearance to your mind is um, more education than you, or at least um, advice that works, then if sometime during the, the, down the track, you feel like you're surpassing them in realizations, you still have this absolute respect and devotion. And it's like you're standing on their shoulders and you'd never be so high unless you were there to, they were there to stand on like that. But that almost, you know, that rarely happens. Usually they feel higher the whole time, but you know, just in case you start to feel like you're, you know, catching up and surpassing them, still you can hold them as this representative and this gateway to this divine energy. So the guru is so tricky because, you know, when we do the water bowls, we space them not too close, not too far apart to represent not being too close to the guru, not too far apart. A little bit of distance is good because the longer you're with a real life human being, the more humanity you see. And you can frame that as kindness of the Buddhas to be relatable. Mm -hmm. You can frame that as your own karmic obscurations bouncing back at you. Or you can get really distracted and obsessed with why did they do that? <laughs> and the last one is the one to avoid. And the easiest way to avoid it is to just see them in class. <laughs> yeah, it's the easiest way to avoid it, yes. So, you know, um, a mind that can handle Tantra is a mind that can hold a lot of nuance, mm -hmm. a lot of nuance and a lot of layers simultaneously, and a lot of seeming contradictions that aren't contradictory, but are dissonant in terms of relative truth and ultimate truth, mm -hmm. because the relative truth of something is always going to be deceptive. And a Tantra mind knows that and plays with it while holding the reality of the ultimate. And to be able to play with convention without losing ethics takes a lot of strength and a lot of integrity. You know, and you can think about times that you've played with convention, 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 you know, not real convention, but like worldly convention in the sense of, you know, what is beauty, what is work, what is important, you know, and you know, when you were a rebellious teenager, for example, maybe you played with convention. Yes. And, um, you know, he did weird things like shave your head or something, you know, or dyed your hair blue. I don't know. And now we're grown ups and we do the same thing. But, um, you know, play with convention. You know, this is something very useful to us. But the danger is if you say, say how artists could take a picture of a rubbish heap and if they frame it just right, suddenly garbage becomes art. Challenging convention. Wonderful, beautiful. Do that. It creates a grand flexibility of mind. But if you don't hold on to the fact of cause and effect and the truth of ethics, then that very same flexibility can make you make what is bad into something that is good and what is good into something that is bad. Mm -hmm. And what is harmful, you can tell yourself is helpful and what is helpful, you can tell yourself is harmful and it gets nuts. So that's why this kind of ability to hold dissonant truths that are actually complementary, but for us feel a little bit like mental gymnastics and they feel a little bit like even cognitive dissonance at times to hold that without madness gentle you know we have to be really gentle so front generation self-generation is something that will keep coming up in all tantric texts every single tantric text whether implicit or explicit so the front generation, you can be a little bit more literal about that is my teacher out there in the aspect of that deity. Mm -hmm. Then front generation, now I am that deity with those aspects as the result of having met the teacher. Oh, I get it, I get yeah. it, okay. And then gradually through the practice and through the life, we merge. Right. Yeah, we merge. And then we might kind of unmerge because we're acknowledging that we're not quite there yet. So a lot of Tantra is taking the result as the path. Mm 
you know, taking the finished product and pretending we're already there. Mm -hmm. And then right before you crack and freak out, you let it go and go back to how you are, but you're a little bit closer to enlightenment than when you started. Yeah. And so it's something interesting to play with, but you notice throughout even one very short sadhana, there are times when divine pride of yourself as the deity makes sense. And then times when you need to relax your divine pride for a moment, because now you're purifying the mistakes of the practice. And how could you have made mistakes if you're already the Buddha? Yeah. But then you've done that. And then you adopt the attitude of divine pride again. You're like, I'm a Buddha. Not yet. I'm a Buddha. Not yet. Again and again. I'm a Buddha. Not yet. You know, but, you know, again, this flexibility that Tantra encourages us to have and this playfulness and this way of using objects and sensory things and, you know, relationships and the environment and all of these things, it's a play. And if it's making you joyful and flexible, it's probably going in the right direction. If it's making you, you know, indulgent or nihilistic, it's falling into the two, one of the two extremes. So if you find that starting to happen, if you start getting anything can be anything, therefore everything is nothing. Oh my God, you know, some sort of weird trip like that. That's not what's being asked of us. That's a mistake. But it can happen when you're kind of really deep diving into Tantra, you start questioning what is karma anyway? What is the relationship of karma and emptiness? How does this work? And you can kind of get a little, you know, um, which is why sometimes in Kriya Tantra, because it's lower, there is more emphasis on looking after your physical body, because it's easy to kind of lose touch with conventional reality when you start practicing in this way. And of course, in highest yoga Tantra, you look after the body as well, but it's not as emphasized. Sort of the higher you get in the Tantras, the less you need to worry about your body because you've kind of matured enough to not go too far with it. But Kriya Tantra, there's a lot of emphasis on staying clean, on eating really healthy foods, on sleeping the right amount and sleeping at the right times. It's just really good basic common sense stuff. And that's not accidental. Yeah. So you've got good common sense grounding plus all of this kind of magic ephemeral stuff. Questions? Thoughts? It's a lot to touch all at once. Um, but, you know, just kind of let it brew, let it brew. So front generation, self-generation is something that will make more and more sense over time. And throughout any practice, one is gonna be emphasized more than the other. It kind of, you take turns what object you're focusing on. And throughout these meditations, the visualizations get layered but you don't need to feel really tight like you need to hold on to every piece and every step of the visualization. It's kind of like you clarify one piece and then release it and emphasize a different piece and release it and emphasize a different piece. You know, so like we start with our mind as a egg with a D in the middle and then, you know, it dissolves and you become Manjushri. And then we add to Manjushri, Om Ahum. And then you kind of set that awareness aside and just focus on the mantra at the heart. It's not like you have to let go of the body of Manjushri per se, but it's no longer as prominent or as necessary to keep in mind until your mind is really able and spacious enough to hold many details. Yeah. And there's even a time when you let go of all the details and just focus on the D. Yeah, so there's a lot of different um, layers. And um, all Kriya Tantra practices also can use this practice of generating the deity through the six devas that we did when we did um, Chen Rezig practice. Sometimes it's implicit, sometimes it's explicit, but that cool six deities self-generation that can be plugged into any Kriya Tantra practice. And that's lovely too. Um, but back to more tangible wisdoms, and then we'll call it a day. And tomorrow we'll look into just the meaning of each syllable of the mantra and the iconography and do the practice one more time. So great understanding is in the form of Manjushri. And then we have clear wisdom, which is in the form of the mantra itself, Omarapatsana Di. So you can have it, you know, in a straight line in Tibetan syllables, a straight line in English syllables, can have it in a circle, you can have it in that um, wheel of swords 
or um, kind of whatever works for you. And again, if it's too much, orange light, just orange light. And so this Omarapatsana D is emitted from the Manjushri in front and then absorbs into me the Manjushri here, self Manjushri, fills your whole body. If you don't have the empowerment, orange light comes from the front generated Manjushri to the one at your crown. And then from the one at your crown, you can think nectar light flows down and through you. So that's the adjustment to make if you don't have the empowerment, is that these Omarapatsana D or Manjushris or whatever wisdom that we're up to, um, that it goes to that one above and then trickles down. Yeah. And then the atoms of nectar clarified as Omarapatsana D, then they radiate out or they radiate out to all the other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas victorious ones and their sons just means Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And we're hooking in the clear wisdom of all of them, not just Manjushri in the form of a Rapatsana D and it absorbs into me and fills my whole body. Yeah. So this is kind of how it goes. You have the front Manjushri, you have the self Manjushri, the wisdom of whatever type is coming towards you if you have the empowerment or towards the one at your crown if you don't. And then once it's all there, then light goes out or light goes out in, uh, in the form of this orange nectar light with the Omarapatsana D or whatever. And it invites all that energy from all other Buddhas. Yep. So you're getting that form of wisdom from Manjushri, then you're getting that form of wisdom from all enlightened beings. Yeah, both. Yeah. And then you think that it's stabilized in your heart. And the truth of it is you have planted the seed for that in your mental continuum by thinking in this way. So there's a truth to it. It's not just playing pretends. Yeah, you have planted the seed for that in your heart. And it's also just a nice reminder of the things we wanna be focusing on in our life. Like, sure, we want to weed the garden, but more importantly, we want clear wisdom. <laughs> You know, it can understand and clarify details of very subtle and extremely subtle difficult points without resistance. And we need that for our own practice and we need that in order to benefit others. Then we've got quick wisdom, which cuts non-understanding and wrong understanding and afflicted doubt. So you can have doubt, it's just cutting the afflicted doubt, that kind of, um, ready to be confused, that kind of like despondent attitude that's like, I don't understand, I don't understand, this is too hard, this is too hard, or the like intellectual arrogance that says, if I don't understand it, it must not be true, or it must not be understandable, because I'm a very smart person, and I would know it, you know, so it's cutting both kinds of doubt, but that afflicted kind, that's got some sort of um, attachment or anger or jealousy, pride, kind of like wrapped up with it cutting that. So that's all in the form of D, again in English or in Tibetan as you like. And then we have profound wisdom, which can understand and explain the meanings of scripture in depth without resistance. And this is in the form of the implements of Manjushri. And the implements of Manjushri are his sword and the text. And I put kind of a literal text here just to kind of help with your visualization, but you can think of them kind of in this tanka form too, if you prefer. And then the wisdom to explain the Dharma, which gives definite supreme understanding of all the meanings of the words of the scriptures without resistance. And this one is really useful for teachers of all kinds and translators of all kinds, but also if you're um, often the dominant or supportive friend, like the one with the most mental health or the one who's always kind of supporting people, it can kind of help you be more quick and descriptive and decisive in the advice that you give. And so you think of this in the form of Dharma texts. And then debating wisdom, this can really come in handy if you have troublemakers in your life. And we're all going to have troublemakers in our life. So we might as well get this debating wisdom, which is to achieve bravery over evil debate without resistance. 
so there's a point to clarify here, which is it's not about winning arguments by dominating people and making them think that they're stupid. It's about convincing people of true wisdom, which might involve intimidating their afflictions, subduing their afflictions, but not them as a person, not putting them down as a person, but you're kind of um, too big for their anger to have room or you're too big for their pride to have room. Or you can think of it in terms of gentleness, but in this case, Manjushri, that sword cutting through ignorance, it can be swift and decisive, but not hurt a bit, not hurt a bit. And that's the difference between winning an argument from anger and dominance while still using your intelligence and winning an argument from intelligence, kindness and compassion. And I think it helps to just remember times in your life where someone has corrected you but it didn't hurt, yeah? Like we've been corrected many times in our life when it hurt like heck, right? When it was like a hit, it felt like someone shot an arrow in our heart, it was so unkind. And then there've been times when someone just gently nudged us the right direction and in no way did it feel like an assault. So this is what we're looking for, this kind of debate that can really help people come to wisdom. Yeah help people come to wisdom. And we really need that in this day and age as things become more and more degenerate. Yes, even with them, um, there might be a case for this being very useful during times of pandemic. Details, um, you can sort out yourself. So then this wisdom of composition was the last one. And here's where Manjushri, the front generation Manjushri transforms into Lama Tsongkhapa and his two disciples. And both Manjushri and Lama Tsongkhapa and his two disciples are one in nature with your own root guru. But it's kind of helping you understand that the wisdom of composition is related very much to the human form of things. And so Lama Tsongkhapa's wisdom of composition, of course, is what we aspire to, like his writings of Lam Rim Chinmo. So it's clarified as both texts and wheels of swords. All right, so those are your wisdoms. Um, any thoughts about those wisdoms or any questions? Yeah, Eleanor, go ahead. Oh, unmute, please. There you sorry, go. Oh. sorry. No worries. You're good. <clears throat> Just a point of clarification. Um, visualizing the deity as a as a re somebody real. It's not a statue. Yeah. Yeah. Real, not a statue, but also somehow made of light. Right. Yes, which is weird, right? But they say that when you're visualizing the deity out in front of you, like in this case, you know, made of orange light, transparent light, you want to have a sense that it could move, that it could talk to you. Right. Yeah. Yes. And you're using things like statues and pictures as a reference. But just like when you're doing sutra style meditation and you're meditating Shakyamuni Buddha, you see a Buddha, but then you close your eyes and you bring it to your mind's eye. So it's not what you've literally seen. You're taking what you've literally seen as a reference. Mm, and you're right. thinking of it three-dimensional and living <clears throat> and made of light. Thank you. Thank you. You yeah. have a question. Sure. I'm sorry, did you? The yeah, other sure. one I was... It was Is there somebody else talking? Mm -mm. No. Oh, no, no. I, I just, I just wanted to know about the, um, the mantra about the rhythm. Mm. I'm really interested in the rhythm, of of um, using rhythm in, sorry, in the, the in the mala. Yeah, sorry. Mm. Mm. Do you like know, um, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um. You know, the rhythm of the mantra, again, it's like not too fast, not too slow. And it might be related to how fast your hands move as well. And, you know, some days we have kind of stiff days and the mantra, and the you know, the mall is not going too fast because, yeah, because the hands are a little bit grumpy. Um, if your hands are really rebellious and they're really having a stiff day, you can do more than one mantra per bead. Um, technically, you're supposed to only do one mantra per bead, but there's always exceptions for illness and age. So just side note, if you want to be doing several mantras per bead, that's okay. Um, 
you know, and, and often we have a little marker at like seven. See, mine's got a little green one at seven um, and a little green one at 28. But anyway, um, so if you have a mantra commitment, you can be counting, but you know, you know that you've got four per bead. So when you get to seven, it's four times seven, stuff like that. Logistics. Okay. But when you're doing the mantra, it needs to be slow enough that each syllable could be heard if someone had their ear right against your mouth. But it should be quiet so that if someone was right by your shoulder, they couldn't hear it. So it's important that air is coming through because that helps your subtle energy system. There is times when you close your mouth and just hear the sound of the mantra resonating in space when you're doing the Kriya Tantra practice of abiding in sound. But for the most part, we do the Kriya Tantra practice of abiding in fire, which sounds very exciting, but it just means the visualization of light going out, light coming in, light going out, light coming in. And for that, you need to be saying it out loud. So, it, it, you know, you just start Oma Rapatsana Di, 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 Oma You know, so I'm getting to like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four in terms of my speed. You don't have to get that fast if you don't want to. But, you know, you, that's why we start by chanting it out loud is we're getting each syllable really distinct, really clear. We're getting it really reverberating in our system. And then we release singing it out loud and come into just the gentle air. But it might be too soon to immediately go to air. So we, you know, oh, my rapids on a deal more up until it's just under the breath. But is that the question you were asking or you're, you're kind of trying to figure out the right pace of it or? No, no, I was thinking about the rhythm, more the rhythm and the energy. And uh, uh, yeah, because uh, I like like the energy of it. Yeah. You know, the energy of Mother Earth and vibrating with the Earth and, you know, um, hard to kind of explain, but that's something that I, I tend towards mm. Mm. yeah and and I think that it's kind of intuitive what's the right pace for you because you get into the zone and you mm. get into kind of a flow state with it yeah yeah so in the beginning yeah. all all mantras are a little bit awkward in the beginning but through repetition just like let it be awkward and clunky until you get used to it and then it starts to flow and then yeah. really the rhythm is up to you but as long as each syllable is distinct that's the important thing. So don't go yeah. so fast that it blurs. Right. And yeah. I think that I it, flows through, it flows through the body is you what I was, uh, yeah. Yeah, it definitely yeah. does. Yeah. Definitely does, especially you. if you're in the flow state. I think if you're pushing to go to faster than you're able to, or if you're kind of like, I don't know, having resistance and going a bit too slow, then you don't get that nice feeling in your energy system. Mm. But sometimes that nice blissful feeling you'll get in your energy system with mantra is because you've hit the right speed and you've got a good level of concentration that's not too tight, not too loose. So mm. if you feel like a tightness start to happen in your heart or a tightness start to happen in your stomach, you're probably pushing too fast or there's something is funny about the rhythm and the pacing. Mm. So just adjust it a little bit. Yeah, but it, okay. it, for the most part, it's, it's an intuitive thing. You can feel, is this the right pace for you or not? So when you're in a group, you try and go along with the group. But as soon as people click into the silent under the breath, totally go the speed you want to go. Completely your speed. Yeah. Um, when you're doing a, a retreat, you know, when we do the retreats where we're accumulating hundreds of thousands of mantras, um, there is a need for a little bit more speed. Um, and sometimes there is a little bit of pushing to increase your level of focus. But it's always more important to connect with the deity than to finish your mantras. So if you're ever doing one of these retreats again where you're doing a big accumulation, the number is just kind of a, a rough idea of how many it takes to come closer to the, the deity than you were before. That's why they're called an approach retreat. You're approaching the deity. You're coming closer to the deity. And so for Chen Rezig, for example, you want to do 600,000 on the same seat without missing a day. That sounds like a lot, but then you realize it only takes three weeks, you know, <laughs> but if it takes more than three weeks, that's okay. You know, 
because what are you going to do when you finish you're just going to keep doing it anyway <laughs> yeah it's just when you finish these retreats you have certain permissions to um repair broken samaya broken vows you have um, permission to offer certain things to other people and so accomplishing these numerical things mm -hmm. is useful very much for your work for others as well as being able to repair vows when you're by yourself so that's why we do these numerical retreats is to kind of increase our purification abilities so we have less reliance on external teachers so that that's anyway just a side note because I know sometimes those retreats can be a little full on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and the tunes for some of the mantras have been inspired by Dakinis and have been told to meditators in their caves, and some of them have just been made up by whoever and are just a nice way to sing it out loud, and it really depends on the mantra. But uh, for the most part. If you just try and stick with how your teacher taught it to you, you know, the pronunciation, just try. But remember, intention is more important than accuracy. Intention. There's always the story of the, yes, the old story that always gets taught in this context, which is there was a, a student who was annoying his teacher by asking for a mantra. Give me a mantra, give me a mantra. Yeah, and he kept bugging him and the teacher was grumpy and he said, your nose looks like a walnut. <laughs> you know, like he was just <laughs> in a grumpy mood. He said, your nose looks like a walnut. And the student was a little bit slow and he said, oh, my mantra is my nose looks like a walnut. Okay, my nose looks like a walnut. My nose looks like a walnut. And he said it with pure devotion and he achieved all sorts of realizations. So, <laughs> classic, yes, classic. Or uh, the, the story of the dog's tooth that someone gave to this um, old mother and said this is the Buddha's relic and it was just a dog's tooth but she had absolute faith and belief in it and it started replicating Aww. and making whatever so intention 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 mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know maybe we should um make you happy yes <laughs> it's like we're not going to be perfect and we don't even have to be for it to work yeah because mm -hmm. again these are just these are just formulas. They're just like, it's a little bit like a recipe, you know? And when you're learning a recipe, you really need to follow it. But then when you're good at it, you can start to play and be creative because you know what tastes go with which tastes and you know the proportions that work. So really see these sadhanas as like recipes and someone very enlightened made these recipes, but then eventually you're gonna personalize them and make them your own. And the root recipe was always important, but also so is making it suit your taste. So um, are there any hanging questions about the sadhana? Because um, tomorrow we're mostly just going to do mantra and iconography or about how to do sadhanas before we call it a day. Good. Enough to be getting on with at least. Yes. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll, um, we'll go ahead and dedicate. So just think that all of the energy we put into this practice, may it lead to the enlightenment of all sentient beings. Janchu samcho rinpo she, ma ke pa nam ke gyu chi, ke pa nyam pa me pa yi, go ne go ndu pa toni da wa rinpo she, Ma ke pa nam ke gyu chi, ke pa nyam pa me pa yi, gon he gon du The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, the incomparably kind Supreme Tenzin Gatso, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjuna's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three sublime ones, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Okay. 
So have a good night, everyone. And uh, we'll be back here tomorrow at 930 Pacific. And uh, it'll just be a half day tomorrow. So thanks so much. It was lovely to practice with you.